Employment legislation may be a rather dry topic, but of course it's an important one. Um, over the last few years, we've seen governments tightening up employment legislations across Europe. Broadly, this has been to protect the rights of blue-collar workers as well as to make sure that workers are paying the right tax. But of course, it affects everyone from highly skilled and highly paid people right down to those gig workers. Um, Albert, Harvanash worked with about 8,000 of these highly skilled and highly paid contractors and interim managers across Europe. Um, what effect are we seeing this legislation have on them? Well, Rob, let's be perfectly clear at the outset. Our, the, the, the protection for the, for the so-called gig worker or the economy that's called the gig economy and all those individuals and labour participants that are involved in the gig economy, protections and the confusion around you know, employment status and the court cases we're seeing, whether it's Uber or whether it's Deliveroo, I think all of that is probably a good evolution because that's a new market and yeah. regulators and government are trying to get to grips with it. And, of course, whether people are on living, living wages, whether they're paying the right taxes, and whether they're actually being treated with respect and they have some rights. I think we support all that. But what we're talking about is not that economy. We're talking about the highly skilled, flexible labour market, which we call, you know, the consulting economy or the IT contracting economy, and that's at the core of our business. And so so what, what kind of effect is the legislation having on those people? Because these people may be on $100,000 a year plus. What's the effect? You're absolutely right. I, I believe our average is over $100,000 per annum equivalent. So the individuals that are working for Harvey Nash, the Harvey Nash Group are generally entrepreneurs who are self-employed who treat themselves as independent freelance contractors who were, as, you, as, as, as it were, loaning out their skills and, and labour to our clients and getting paid a fairly significant chunk of money for that. And that's the sort of market that we're talking about. And how it's affecting them is typical with all of these legislations. You, one takes sometimes a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Yeah. And I think that they've, they've all been caught by this general move to clamp down on what you, know, you read in the papers is called the flexible labour market. Okay, so I suppose that's the effect from the, the, the perspective of the contract. But what about the organisations themselves that are employing them? What... What effect is the legislation having on them? Is it a positive effect or otherwise? Well, we've seen a chilling effect when these, when these new regulations have been either mooted in the press or they've actually been put into place. I-35 in the UK <clears throat> is a good example. You know, lots of confusion. Who does it, you know, how does it work? Who, who's caught by it? Who's not caught by it? What are the tests? You know, these sorts of things are complicated and it has a chilling effect because companies immediately want advice. They're uncertain. Yeah, and a yeah. company that's uncertain is, all, is never a good thing because, you know, it stops them hiring, things get put on hold, projects get delayed, and work ultimately gets deferred into the future. And that's not good for anybody. I think in, in one of our recent uh, CIO surveys, it indicated that two-thirds of um, leaders felt that the economy and the world was becoming increasingly unpredictable. And, and of course, companies compensate a lot of that for, by yeah, getting flexible labour. Right, yeah. But is, is the regulation actually stopping them doing that, and what is the effect of that? Well, one of the impacts of digital has been that companies are using flexible labour, sort of top up the, the peaks and troughs in demand. And so that's an increasing trend across Europe and across the world. And so for governments then to target that practice, which is actually yeah. good, because it allows companies to hire on a flexible basis for short, relatively short periods of time and not assume sort of overwhelming liabilities or balance sheet liabilities, pensions and all kinds of other things. It allows them to do business, to be productive and to meet those digital challenges where they get those spikes in demand. And now governments, in, in sort of trying to attack a, a market like the gig economy where they feel politically under pressure, they've unfortunately also... Um, Made any had an impact on on this highly skilled market. So obviously the EU is quite a big place, but um, are you seeing any differences between countries about how they're dealing with regulation and how it's affecting companies? Yes. Well, in the UK, under the previous administration, the coalition government, we yep. actually saw them try and make the UK economy more flexible from a labour perspective. There were a raft of new measures that were introduced, which tried to roll back some of the you know, some of the legislation, so that companies felt more confident to hire people. And, of course, we have the lowest unemployment, the UK at least, has the lowest unemployment in Europe in terms of figures. Only the Germans come close. Right, right. And 
But on the other side of the channel, if you look at the, 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 the core mainland EU, you've seen um, in Germany and in Holland in, in particular measures and legislation passed to tighten this area and to make it more inflexible. But it's been, certainly in Holland, there's been a recent change in that ledger, or at least a change in approach. Do you want to just kind of talk through that? Yes, and, 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 quite and our, that. our managing director yeah. there has been very exercised by this, yeah. and uh, he calls it the DBA Act, which I believe that's the sort of official, unofficial term. And what it is, is really targeting companies as ind and individuals who are working flexibly together, um, either as subcontractors or companies hiring temporary labour. And trying to restrict that, make it more difficult. And it's caused pain, you know, for our independent freelancers and also for our clients in terms of certainty and what the outcome is for them. But we've now seen, after a couple of years of this, the legislature's thinking again, perhaps. And I wouldn't call, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a forecast on this, but it appears that they've made an announcement that they want some sort of moratorium or pause yeah. to see what the impact is. And they actually mention that they're worried about the effect on entrepreneurs and on the flexible labour market. Yeah, it's interesting, even, even the use of the word entrepreneurs and, and then sort of citing that as, a, as an issue. And it also shows that, you know, declaring that actually they weren't sure of what the inputs and outputs will be of this. And it shows it's just such a complex, such a complex issue. So we talked about kind of uh, Europe, we specifically talked about Netherlands and Germany. But what about the UK? Because... Um, IR35 has had quite a bit of in, in impact. Do you want to talk through what our experience of that has yeah. been, both with the workers and also the organisations that have been you know, implementing it? Yes, and you know the, the I35 measures that have been introduced this year, particularly in the public sector, they have created that exact phenomenon of uncertainty and the public sector has been worried about and dealing with um, restructuring all these arrangements and therefore not hiring. So businesses that are exposed to public sector hiring have seen some disruption. But it's fascinating that businesses like ours, because we're a well-known brand, we're a listed company, you know, that comes with yeah. a whole bunch of transparency, our balance sheets, people know our financial position, it's all public. Actually, it's boosted confidence that a business like the Harvey Nash Group has the capability, the resources, the intellectual capital, the resources, if you like, to cope with us, to transition our freelancers if we need to, or to or to ensure that they're not caught by the legislation. So we've benefited, and we've seen a tremendous uptick in the second half in terms of benefit to us. But the, the, but the market, it's been difficult because the smaller, in, uh, smaller companies and companies that haven't got the resources have obviously, it's, for them it's been a negative. Yeah, I mean, to, to some extent, because IR35 IR looks at the classification of people um, working for an organisation and potentially moves people from a contractor category into... Um, paid employment, yes. which obviously has quite a big implication on tax and pay and lots of other things. Um, what are we seeing in, say, like the South East uh, and in public sector organisations where IR35 is being implemented very strongly? Are we seeing that those contractors are just going to become um, paid employees or, or is some, there some other response? Well, it's been quite interesting because there hasn't been a common trend in, across, the, across the UK. Right. What we've seen is where the, in, in regions where the public sector is a dominant employer, and where those consultants or perhaps have got deep roots in that community, yeah. perhaps you know they've, they've been there for many years or they've grown up in that community, the resistance to this has been low and it's been relatively, it's relatively smooth. Where there's a big market like London with a lot of skills transfers, a lot of immigration, and a lot of choice, and the largest employers are private companies, we've seen literally... Uh, droves of contractors move out of the public sector and into the private sector because they clearly have made a decision, you know, by, 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 by moving, voting with their feet. Well, I've held off mentioning this word up until now, but I'm forced to say it. Brexit. Um, so, yeah, obviously regulation. That dreaded <laughs> Brexit word. <laughs> well, regulation is a massive part of Brexit um, and keeping a, a level playing field across the EU. So Brexit, how do you think that's going to play out for it? for the UK and Europe, and, and what are the implications? Well, in this huge market, remember the largest single market in the world of 500 million people, wealthy people, the largest market on the planet. We've got all these different, different directions, if you like, on labor. We've had the Germans 12 to 18 months ago also tighten their regulations around flexible labor. We know that the Southern European states are all very tight and, and inflexible. But in the north, typically, you know, we've always seen 
Holland, for example, Belgium, sometimes these sorts of co these countries have always been, had an open and a flexible approach to labour. And of course, the UK has probably been, you know, called the, the most flexible market in Europe and in this market. However, I think that Brexit is an, is, is is a sort of, if you like, an asteroid that comes into this and disrupts everything. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm very interested, and this is only my instinct, it's not a forecast, that actually, this is actually the Brexit question. And of course, as you know, the Singapore option, as it's called, where as where Britain, if it's left, or the government, if they're yep. left with a, a, a settlement that falls short of expectations, they've talked about having a Singapore option, which is, you know, to be a competitive influence within this market or outside of this market. That's creating its own competitive nature and reactions around this market. So, you know, if I'm, as a business person, with a vested interest in the single market and all of our subsidiaries right across Europe prospering, I don't think that's a bad thing. So, actually, it's almost like... The, the, the prospects or the possibility of Brexit is actually a, a, a kind of a market force for the whole of the EU, and that, that might actually have an overall effect both for the UK and the EU. Not a forecast, but my instinct is that it might have a galvanizing effect on legislators who were keen to move the needle far along the road of inflexible markets. That appetite might be blunted, and the, and the needle might be, the pendulum might swing back towards the sort of traditional flexible markets that we've enjoyed in the past. Interesting. Albert Ellis, thank you very much.